Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Paul Thiessen, Ali Sanjabi, AP Puppy, and two new patrons, Leonard and Nathan. Yay! Yay. Thanks for joining us. On this episode of DTNS, OpenAI just dunked on Google. Maybe. We're going to find out on Monday. Where is Blue Sky in the social network landscape? And David Spark is with us to talk about what all happened at the RSA conference this week. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, May 10th, 2024. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us is David Spark, producer and host of the CISO series and frequent guest after <laughs> RSA conferences. Hi, David. Welcome back. I am thrilled to be back. Well, we're, we're thrilled, thrilled to, to you. we're thrilled to have you. Um, all right, let's get into some tech news, starting with the quick hits. Google is urging some 2 billion Chrome users to update their browser as soon as possible. The issue is a use a, a use after free memory exploit designated CVE 2024-4671 that was found in the wild. Users can manually update Chrome by updating Chrome, opening Chrome, and then clicking on three vertical dots in the upper right corner. That's where you can get your settings. Then you select help and about Chrome and go from there. Starting June 10th, Nintendo will stop integrating the ability to post images and video to X from the Nintendo Switch Gallery or send friend requests to social media users via the friend suggestions feature. X reportedly charges API fees starting at $42,000 monthly for this. Nintendo is the last of the big three console makers to pull the plug after Sony's PlayStation and Microsoft's Xbox did the same. At the Bloomberg Technology Summit, Xbox president Sarah Bond announced that the Xbox mobile gaming store would launch in July. The store would initially start on web and focus on first-party mobile titles like Candy Crush Saga and Call of Duty Mobile. Bond also said that the store could extend beyond the web, hinting at a rival app store to Google Play Store and Apple Play Stores as well. Apple has apologized for its crush ad video for the new iPad after a backlash from artists and creators. Critics felt the video, which showed instruments and other creativity tools, crushed down to make an iPad was insensitive and dehumanized artistic expression. The company was quoted in Ad Age saying, we missed the mark with this video and we are sorry. I feel vindicated, but you know what? That's a story for uh, Apple Vision Show, <laughs> which you should subscribe to. Okay. Spotify's podcasting studio chief, Julie McNamara, is departing the company in a memo to staff. McNamara explained that she was returning to her creative roots. When she arrived, Spotify was aggressively expanding into podcasting as part of a broader bid to take Apple Podcasts market share or at least, you know, lean into it a little bit. But exclusive deals such as with Prince Harry, Meghan Markle, the Obamas, Kim Kardashian, and others cost Spotify an estimated $1 billion. And it appears the company is returning back to its creative roots as well. All right, Rob, let's talk about uh, not only Google I.O., but like, who is getting into that news mix? Yeah, we've got some classic tech petty going on. So Google I.O. starts next Tuesday, but in a move to possibly steal a bit of the limelight from the search giant, OpenAI has announced a live stream on Monday, May 13th, where the company will unveil some ChatGPT and GPT-4 updates, possibly including an AI-powered search engine. This wouldn't be OpenAI's first go-around with search as the company attempted to give ChatGPT access to live web data via plugins. That attempt was discontinued in April, presumably because ChatGPT like all LLM struggles with providing accurate up-to-date information via real-time search queries. Yeah. So this Monday announcement tracks with earlier reports from both Bloomberg and the information that I'll also suggest OpenAI is developing an AI-based product that is capable of searching the internet 
which could possibly have integration points with Microsoft's Bing. Now, OpenAI's search engine is expected to work by effectively asking questions to chat GPT with the, with the bot bringing back answers with images and citations from the web. Do we think Google can maintain its search dominance the way that people kind of always think like, just Google it type that uh, when, uh, you know, we've got LLMs coming on the scene. So this is a, this is a really, really good question because search could fundamentally change if we stop going to Google or going to, uh, you know, you know, to, to Bing or going to, you know, DuckDuckGo to do our searches. If we just start asking our assistants, if we just start asking our LLMs, search fundamentally changes. So this is a big deal because Google is already working on trying to integrate their AI stuff into search. Uh, um, Microsoft has already integrated their AI into Bing, and now ChatGPT is doing it. But ChatGPT is a little different than Microsoft. They they are the fastest growing service that Earth has ever seen. They've got a lot of goodwill. So the question is, will they have the opportunity to break into Google's dominance? Because Google, Google just absolutely dominates search. It's it's not even, you know, everyone else is literally right. a rounding air compared yeah. to Rob. Them. I see so, a res- I see a resurgence of Ask Jeeves here. Here's why. Hear me out on this, because the whole thing with OpenAI and with ChatGPT is these natural language questions. Well, Ask Jeeves blew it, right? That was the, their kind of their intention predating any kind of AI. But the intention was there. And yes, this is a going to be a very intense battle because the money in search is huge. Even if you steal a single percentage point of the whole search community, it is huge, huge money. So there will be a lot of money thrown at this for a long period of time. And it's going to keep going on because the goal is to get that moment of upswing, if you will, where everyone starts going your way, kind of like what Google did. Anyways, I liken it back to what Ask Jeeves tried to do at the beginning. Maybe we'll see a resurgence in that term. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I I sort of I I I'm not I don't have a dog in the fight between like open AI versus Google, you know, and the search war. But I like the idea in principle of just like let's just shake it up. You know, what do you got, open AI? You know, maybe, you know, Google who has uh, enjoyed uh just dominant search for I don't know. I mean, as long as I've been an adult, <laughs> it's been decades now. It's, it's literally been and the decades. internet has been a thing. You know, it's like you know, let you know. Maybe we all benefit from you know a little a little fight to the duel thing. Well, the competition here. breeds quality, as as sure. we hope here. But I think we've all seen, and we'll see it more with uh, AI than we will see in search, because you know how they did this battle with the search, like check out the quality of Bing compared to Google. And they even created split screens for that as well. Well, if you've, you know, played with these different um, tools and you've asked the same question of both, you get very different answers as well. Mm, yeah. Um, we'll see over time if people get an allegiance to them or they like playing them off of each other, which is right now, I think a lot of people like playing them off of each other. Yeah. And, and from Google's standpoint, they have to win here. Their, their business is search. So if if when people think of your company, they they you know you know Google is a verb now. That that is what you do when you go to search for stuff. Yeah. They simply cannot lose here. So I'm going to be really interested to see number one how good does the, you know whatever OpenAI comes out with how how effective is it how well does it work. And two, can they, as you say, can they, can they pull off just a percent? Can they pull off, you know, a, a couple percent? If they can do that, the industry changes because search dominates everything. And if people just start talking to their devices, asking questions like you were on the, you know, on the Star Trek, you know, Starship Enterprise, that is just going to change the way people interact with search engines. And that is not necessarily a good thing for Google unless they can lead the charge with this AI integration into it. Uh, totally agree. Yeah. Uh, well, um, 
<laughs> OpenAI is going to announce something on Monday, which would be May 1, 2, 3, 13th. Um, uh, and we're going to learn a lot more at that time. Petty stuff. I love it. You know, and then Google I, uh, I O also going to be announcing a lot of stuff. You know, yeah, it's going so. it's it's to be a yeah. fun week next week. It's gonna but be a fun I, I'm week. all for, I'm I'm all for the petty part of it. Sam. So Sam. earlier this week, I think it was early this week or it was late last week, we heard that uh, Jack Dorsey was stepping down from the board or had stepped down from the board of Blue Sky. But the former Twitter CEO and board member of Blue Sky claims that the decentralized social network is literally repeating all the mistakes of Twitter during his ten tenure at Twitter when he actually ran that company. One example he cites for his disillusionment in Blue Sky is kicking people off the service. In an interview with Mike Solana of Founders Fund, Dorsey says his biggest issues with Blue Sky revolve around Blue Sky becoming a separate company from Twitter and his content moderation policies. In the interview, Dorsey did confirm that he is financially backing Noster, which is another decentralized Twitter-like service. Okay, so knowing all of this, as far as Blue Sky goes going forward, because it is going forward, the platform is rolling out an updated version of its app that lets users offer feedback about its algorithmic feed so they can better customize it using things like show more like this, show less like this buttons in a post menu to choose what content the algorithm does surface. Blue Sky says the goal is to offer a timeline that takes into consideration users' own preferences, not what the company thinks they should see. You know, that's, you know, sort of just lip service, but, but that actually might work for you depending on what kind of social, uh, uh, service you want to see. The company also lets users roll out their own custom feeds so that others can subscribe to those feeds. And these feeds may have different themes or algorithms than Blue Sky's own Discover feed, which is more about general discovery, as many other social networks do. All right, David, um, you know, given all of this, what 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 what's your take on social media these days? Uh, well, I can say for the security community, there has been a mass exodus from Twitter. Uh, it's interesting. We used to, to just give you a sort of a sort of an anecdotal uh, access on that. We would always ask our guests, do they have a Twitter account so we can, you know, promote them for our show through Twitter? And I would say one in 20 has one now. So many people have shut them down, not yeah. using them. Now, as for going over to Blue Sky, there was initial interest, but no major excitement. Right now, what I see specifically in the security community is heavy use in both LinkedIn, also on Reddit, and on Discord. And with the CISOs, the people who are at the highest level, heavy use on Slack. Interesting. Uh, heavy, heavier use on Slack rather than Discord. That surprises for, me. For specifically CISO. So CISO, yeah. it stands for Chief Information Security Officer. And what there are is they are CISO-specific communities where they ask questions about, you know, leadership questions or how you handle certain things. And we see that mostly happening over on Slack. Uh, we don't see it happening much on Discord. And again, hmm. this is purely anecdotal from what we've seen. Of course, of course. Well, going back to, you know, Blue Sky, Blue Sky, um, obviously, uh, uh, initially being a, an offshoot of Twitter that was supposed to be a philanthropic part of, uh, you know, you know, something, something that was Twitter, but a little bit different, didn't work out that way with Jack Dorsey saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fully out of here. I'm going to work on, you know, something else. And uh, Blue Sky is still enjoying, you know, a lot of folks who have said, well, t X, you know, formerly Twitter, not for me, um, but I like Blue Sky, so I'm into it. Um, I don't know how much it really matters that, you know, <laughs> somebody that was, you know, at, you know, in the, um, the early stages of a platform and then on the board and now is not there anymore really matters. If you like the platform, Rob, you know, what do you think about, you know, what blue sky is doing and, you know, based so, on, based on our options, you know, where we go. 
Um, so initially when Blue Sky came out, I didn't really pay a lot of attention to it. It was okay, maybe, maybe LinkedIn. Maybe maybe I'll go there and and be bigger there. I, I definitely got way more into Discord. Um, but when threads came out, it literally had tens of millions of people on it within a couple of days. It had a hundred million people on it within a, you know, within a month, uh, you sure, know, so because, you it know, grew so fast. Like all meta, you know, Instagram people. Right. So it, it, it grew pretty quickly. So I just didn't pay a lot of attention to threads or, or to, or to, I should say to uh, blue sky, but I will say that probably in the last three months, I've been like, okay, that's kind of a cool feature there. Oh, that's kind of a cool feature there. And what's really getting me right now is that if you have the ability to really control what shows up in your timeline, that is one of the the, the issues that I kind of have with threads right now is that it, it's very difficult to try to just, you know, hone into just what I want to see. It's, it's either who I follow or what they decide to show me. But if you're going to if, if Blue Sky is going to allow you to kind of you know, to curate your own feed. Yeah. Uh, that like is very RSS interesting. In a way. Yeah. That's, that's very interesting to me because that would allow me to go and look at it and get the specific information that I want. One of the things that I will say that I do like about, uh, about X, what, what I loved about Twitter was tweet debt and the ability to throw whoever I wanted to follow into a list and then literally go very specifically, look at that list. And that although that does exist in other places, uh, it doesn't exist on threads, which is quite large. And it's just different kind of everywhere else. So I'm really interested to see how this curated feed is going to work for Blue Sky. That that could, in, in, for me, it could pull me back over to that platform. Uh, David, uh, what kind of feeds are you watching these days that are important to you? Like, where do they come from? Um, I go back to what I said before. We are a big fan of, you know, again, I'm just speaking about cybersecurity. The cybersecurity subreddit is a very, very good feed. Actually, it's pretty strong. We love that. We actually source that for a lot of our material for our programming. Also, LinkedIn uh, as well has been very strong and powerful for us as well, uh, as much. And then um, we are exploring other areas um, like Discord and also Slack, which, you know, we're heavily in. But I would say those first two sort of become the meat of it. Cool. cool. Twitter used to be good, but ugh, not anymore. <laughs> What's Twitter, David? It's <laughs> or X. X. I'm sorry. I, st oh, I still have not rolled over to calling it X yet. I know. I mean, I'm still always like X, you know, formerly Twitter. And people go, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> So, folks, I know that it's Friday and folks are like, well, where, where's Tom? Tom's not here. He's normally here on Fridays. But if you'd like to get more Tom, you can watch Tom's Top 5, the show where Tom breaks down the top five things you need to know about technology. This week, Tom counts down the top five ways people can steal your password. You can catch it at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, at DTNS Picks on Instagram, and on YouTube at YouTube.com slash Daily Tech News Show. The RSA conference is an annual cybersecurity trade show held in San Francisco, a place where professionals come together, discuss uh, current cyber threats, ways to stop them, emerging threats, you know, how to work together. Now, David Spark, uh, you have been doing this with us, a and, long time. you know, on the Friday after the RSA conference, uh, you know, wraps up in San Francisco for some time. As the producer of the CISO series, and you are, are obviously a regular RSA, uh, RSA attendee, what were the major themes from this year's show that we should all know about? So uh, major themes, no surprise at all, is AI. And AI from two different uh, standpoints, AI from the benefits security professionals are going to get, and also uh, how AI is being used by attackers and also AI in terms of how much privacy is being exposed within your organization. So let me try to boil these down all very quickly. Mm. Um, one benefits, like for example, I saw this one company, AppDome, that allows you to securely uh, add um, or add security to mobile app development as well with really just selecting the kind of security you want and it's actually added into your code. And you can even, you know, red team it and to see if it's actually good security or not. Also, um, 
Microsoft Copilot, which is the essentially AI tool that's built into uh, Office 365, the um, that is a really, really hot, interesting tool, but it also exposes an amazing amount of internal data because you're actually collecting a lot of your personal data. So I spoke with Brian Vecchi over at Veronis, who they've been looking at this a lot. And what their you know, attitude is, is that here's what it's exposing. Let's talk about how we can actually secure the, the private information so not everybody in your company has access to payroll numbers, social security, healthcare information of your fellow coworkers, because surprisingly, when you let this stuff go loose without actually putting limitations to access, which is what security professionals do, well, then you got some serious problems in terms of privacy and revealing stuff. And the other huge thing about AI is that if you're going to use it, or you have to use it because your competitors are using, using it, you've got to figure out a way to securely use it. Moving on just quickly, a company called Illuminate Security I thought was pretty darn cool. They are doing crowdsource detection and threat hunting. Uh, we've seen this a lot with bug bounties, sort of uh, uh, marketplaces for bug bounties. Now this is a marketplace for threat hunting. Also, threat uh, cybersecurity is still very much a human problem. We've seen this a lot as well. You know, so for example, over at Mimecast, Masha Sadova gave a talk and talked about that nearly two times more managers get fish than individual contributors. And also talking about people who are more tenured get fish. And I think that's probably because there's more information on them. But I should also tell you that new employees who have not been educated on what the company's standards are, are often very much fish and uh, fall into traps because they want to do well for the company and yet don't realize that they're being taken advantage of. Another cool thing was about deep fakes. Uh, I thought this was very interesting. Talk to a guy over at a company called NameTag that helps uh, stop the whole the whole situation of deep fakes. So deep fakes happen through what is known as an injection attack. Hmm. And an injection attack is when you can sort of bypass the identity verification process. <coughs> Excuse me. And for example, like, you know, when you go onto your Zoom and you select which camera to use, well, the injection attack won't select actually a camera, but will select another video stream, which would be the deep fake video. And if you remember the, the Hong Kong situation recently where people were on a video call and verified information, and actually $25 million was stolen. Uh, other big trends in the uh, industry is uh, consolidation. All the big players like Fortra, like CrowdStrike, Palo Alto Networks, they're buying up other companies. They are trying to essentially own the full suite of technology that is out there for security professionals. Um, another big trend is CISOs are seriously freaked out about what could happen to them legally. There were two very high profile cases that within the past year, two years, with one being Joe Sullivan of Uber, who was convicted of essentially not uh, properly exposing the information that happened during an attack. And also similarly, that uh, Tim Brown over at uh, SolarWinds had a situation where um, he's been accused of also not revealing information during an attack as well. So, so, so ju just, you know, <laughs> sure, let's I, think, pause. I, I, I think we're, we're all, you know, we're aware of like, you know, if I don't do my job, well, maybe Sarah, I will get dismissed. Um, dismissed but, um, is but, one thing. Being right. Getting right. thrown into but, jail but, is yeah. another. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. Like what, what's, what's, you know, what, what's the deal with, I mean, if you are, um, you know, a CISO expert and you don't do your job the way that the company wants you to do the job. I mean, are we talking like... So hold it. So there's okay. that's the key word. The co it's not the company that wants to do the job. The law wants you to do the job. And the what law. often happens mm -hmm. is the company wants the CISO to hide something that is happening or not reveal the full truth of what is happening. And so the CISO takes an action and becomes liable uh, for that action, when in actuality, it's really the CEO or the board should be liable. So, there, so sure. there's a yeah. lot of issues with regards to are CISOs covered under what is known as DNO 
uh, DNO insurance, which is directors and officers insurance, w will they be, you know, do they have, does their accountability and responsibility match? So if they don't have responsibility, but have high accountability, no well, time to go look for another job because then you'll, then you'll have a situation like this. So there's just, there's been a major, major freak out in the whole community. Like, Hey, I want to do the job and there's a lot of risk of doing the job, but I didn't know that jail time was a possibility here. Yeah. Right. It, it almost reminds me of back in the day when Sarbanes-Oxley came out and you had executives, of, wait a minute, I got to sign what? And if I sign this, you could come back and do what to me and, you know, t literally take my freedom away. So I, I think that it's another moment like that. And I don't want to say that we over, uh, you know, we, we overlooked it, that Sarbanes-Oxley time. It just made it that you couldn't have folks who were in executive positions that were just signing stuff all willy nilly without actually knowing what was going on in an organization. I think these kind of rules or laws or regulations are going to make these CISOs, you, you know, know, you have to absolutely know what's going on in your environment, especially if you're signing off on stuff that ultimately Congress people are going to look at. I want to do, just mention two quick last things about the event. One is uh, who was notably absent just from the trade show floor, Palo Alto Networks, which is huge, and also Qualys were just two uh, notable ones that were not there. Uh, I think some companies are seeing uh, sort of a less value of being on the trade show floor, but the event is so huge and there's so much gravity to the event because of the number of people who are brought that satellite events are actually quite, quite popular as well. And then closing, one super cool thing that I saw there was a company called Ford Networks, completely custom designed a pinball machine that I hadn't, didn't realize you can take an old machine, hire someone to completely reskin it, rebuild it for you in whatever design you want. And uh, that was pretty darn impressive when I saw that. Uh, I would assume Ron Richards, uh, co-host of Android Faithful, would know a lot about this because he's a pinball guy. I'm a pinball guy, too, but I didn't know you could actually hire someone to completely reskin and rebuild a machine. I didn't either. That's I didn't either. And it is not is, cheap, either. This, this is why we have you, David Spark, coming from the RSA uh, conference because, yeah, as you mentioned, lots of stuff going on right now. And uh, thank you so much for for bringing the knowledge all right uh before we close out the show let's check out the mailbag jason writes in i spent a fair amount of time working for a regional I, uh, isp and telco while in college it was good pay fun job they took cu customer security and privacy seriously and invested in training the training stuck with me throughout my career in it the one thing that i pass on to others it's really okay to say no. If you can't validate a request, say no. Be respectful. They may have to get some other help some other way. Each company I've worked with has their own way, but it came down to not succumbing to the inherent pressure to be helpful to the person on the other side of the conversation that you cannot verify. Great show. I've always had that conversation with my aging parents that I will never call them. I will never ask for money or assistance urgently. And that has a clause that you can't call me or my wife or my children, which are my parents, grandkids to verify. Um, uh, David, I know you weren't on the show with us yesterday, but uh, Rob and I were talking to Shannon Morris about um, the many ways that uh, verification can be a little squirrely. Audio verification was something that we were talking about yesterday. Oh, well, I mean, I mean, I'm assuming you've heard like these AI variations of your voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and that, how it, that, it, that it was, that was will our fool you. Mm -hmm. You'll fool yourself. Did did I say that? Yeah. Yeah, they, 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 they are. They're really good. I actually even played with another one last night after we got off the show. <laughs> it's like, Did man, you? these guys are so good. <laughs> and I will, I will, I will iterate again. I will say what I said yesterday. If you have not already signed up for one of these voice automated systems for your banking information, just don't. They they do not force you to do it. Just don't do it. Can yeah. I also let me close with a security tip for everybody on this? And I did this with my family. So all of us. There is an unbelievable amount of audio and video of us on the internet. If someone wanted to fake one of us, they could do it. So 
What I have done, and I recommend it for your employees and your family as well, come up with a verbal password. Should you make a request for some money or to do something, if that verbal password is not in it, even though the image and the voice of you sounds really, really good, it's not real. Make sure that verbal password is set. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, well, uh, David Spark, you always have great advice for us. Uh, thank you for being on the show today. I know it was a much, pretty Sarah. long thank week you, for you. Yes. A long week for you. I mean, as as conferences go, but let folks know where they can keep up with everything that you learned this week and we'll share with them in the future. So we have five podcasts on our network on CISOseries.com. Uh, if you lo- look at the very top of that right there, we're having the finals of one of our shows called Capture the CISO, and it's going to happen a week from today. So click on that and please register for the finals. It's going to be happening on the 17th. It's going to be a super fun event. We had uh, startup cybersecurity startups competing, and these are the three best ones as chosen by our CISOs. So come and participate in the finals next week. So once again, thank you, David Spark, and thank you, patrons. Patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. It's Friday, which means it is time for an end-of-the-week game, and we're changing it up on you this week. David is actually bringing the game we're going to play. I got multiple games for you. Many games. I love a David Spark They're going to be good. It's going to be fun. Uh, Just a reminder, y'all, you can catch the show Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live and we are back bringing it all again to you on monday with justin robert young joining us have a great weekend this week's episodes of daily tech news show were created by the following people host producer and writer tom merritt host producer and writer sarah lane executive producer and booker roger chang Producer, writer, and co-host, Rob Dunwood. Video producer, Joan Coots. Producer at large, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterdeen. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Kep Kipper, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso. We should all have two names. And J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Acast's ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Tom McNeil. Contributors for this week's show include... Justin Robert Young, Chris Christensen, Nika Monfort, Terrence Gaines, Scott Johnson, and Shannon Morris. Guests on this week's show included David Spark. And thanks to all our patrons who make this show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs) 